Okay, we're going to take a look at the game Cedar Mountain, Prelude to Bull Run, August 9th, 1862. And this game is part of the Great Battles of the American Civil War series. But before we look at Cedar Mountain, I thought it might be fun to look at some of the statistics about the series itself. And I got most of these from Board Game Geek. But the first game in the series is, of course, the famous Terrible Swift Sword, the Battle of Gettysburg. They then went on to do other games, smaller ones like Stonewall, which is about the Battle of Kernstown, another large battle, Shiloh, Bloody April. They did one on Pea Ridge, then Drive on Washington, which was the Battle of the Monocacy, Wilson's Creek, Cedar Mountain, the one we're going to look at today, Jackson at the Crossroads, Corinth, and so on. Another big battle, Gleam of Bayonets. And I made up this little document just showing the covers of each of the... Uh, games in the series. Now, some statistics. There were 25 titles in the series, and the series began in 1976 with Terrible Swift Sword, and has been continually in print in some form or another uh, till 2014 with the game Twin Peaks by GMT. So this series has sort of spanned 38 years in the wargaming community, and it's been published by six different companies. And like I mentioned, we have 25 titles. So it's a very successful series. Now, being across different publishers, the quality of the games has varied greatly. Um, I do like the early SPI ones a lot. The Pea Ridge, Wilson's Creek, Washington, Cedar Mountain, Jackson at the Crossroads, so on. The later editions are good. They've upgraded the graphics. But some of these have been, um, well, less than successful. For example, Rio Grande has got um, pretty poor counters, in my opinion. Uh, the Guns of Cedar Creek also doesn't have the greatest counters. I think in their zeal to make nicer looking games, some of the designers um, have made the counters so colorful that it's actually hard to distinguish who's who on the battlefield. So I kind of like uh, a return to the simplicity of this earlier series. But um, I'm going to go through a couple of turns of uh, Cedar Mountain and uh, explain how the system works. Now this system is actually one of my favorite of all the tactical games on the Civil War. And it's nice to see that these are still uh, being produced. Um, I would like to see some of these reprinted, but that's not likely to happen. The odd one has been reprinted and redone, but um, um, I don't think we're going to get the simplicity of the earlier series anymore with the, with the graphics. And uh, I'll show that when I explain Cedar Mountain. So let's take a look at uh, that particular game. Okay, let's take a look at the situation at Cedar Mountain first. Now, in this situation, Jackson's Corps is coming in here from the south and the west. And this is Cedar Mountain itself. I've marked here with little wee X's the victory point squares in the center of the battlefield. And Banks Corps is along Cedar Creek here. And what's happening is Jackson is really outflanking Pope's army, which is down that way on the Rappahannock. And the Battle of Cedar Mountain is really a collision between elements, or Jackson's Corps, and elements of Banks' Corps here. The main action will take place in this area. So that's overall what's happening. Now, these games are tactical. I forget the exact scale, but each hex is around 200 yards or so. And you can get an idea of that uh, tactical scale by looking here at the range effects chart which I hope will stay in focus there. Anyway, you'll get an idea by the weapons. Now, for example, a 12-pound Napoleon uh, cannon can fire 13 hexes in this game, and the 3-inch rifle can fire 20 hexes. Now, the um, parrot rifles fire 26 hexes. That's a heck of a distance. And your rifled muskets can fire up to five, although they will be halved in value. Your carbines range three, smoothbore muskets range two. Gives you an idea of the scale. So these are tactical battles, and uh, they are very well done. Now, 
there's your terrain effects chart. They have all the things we've come to be used to in a Civil War tactical game. Going up and down crests will cost various uh, costs. Crossing streams will be more expensive for artillery. Woods, of course. Trails will make a difference. Roads you'll be able to move faster on. And to change formation. Remember, in this game, you can be in line or in column. And we'll take a look at the uh, counters in a moment. And then, there, of course, here's your chart for train effects uh, on combat. Uh, woods will make a difference. Um, crests will make a difference. That kind of a thing. And, of course, your terrain key over here. Now, this era of maps uh, by SPI, I thought were very good. I really like them. I think they were Simonson, I think. Redmond Simonson, but I really like his maps for this series. They're very well done. Let's take a close-up uh, look at the uh, counters. Okay, here are some sample units from Early's Brigade, and uh, each counter, as you can see, is a regiment, 58th Virginia, 25th Virginia. The brigade commander is clearly delineated on each Regiments, you could tell which regiment or which brigade it was from. And uh, the M or the C designates the type of weapon. Example, R4 means it's armed with rifles, M2 armed with muskets, C armed with carbines. Now the counters are double sided. So, for example, here's the Bedford Independent Company, which is artillery, of course, limbered up. And when you pay the formation change, you flip it and it shows the weapon ready to fire. I just love the simple um, concept in these counters. I thought they were just terrific. Now here's a cavalry unit. So that's White's C independent dismounted. And of course if it flips to its mounted size side, the um, uh, silhouette changes to a man on horseback. There's uh, General Early with his various command ranges and rally abilities and uh, divisions were in a different color and so you got the command chain uh, very clearly. Now the other side of um, infantry units were their routed side. So that's what they look like there. Again, um, I love the simplicity of the counters. And if you look at the Union uh, counters, they're, of course, designed the same way. But when you've got a mess of counters on the board, you can clearly see who is uh, Confederate and who is Union. That's one thing I loved about the counters, the way they were designed. I like the simplicity of this period. And there's a uh, brigade leader and there's a division leader for the Union. So um, I like these counters. I like the uh, game system and I certainly like the board too. Uh, the graphics for this era I thought were very good. So what I'm going to do now is set up the game um, on turn one and go through a few turns. Roll a few dice, give you a few uh, examples of play and just show you uh, the magic of this great little system. Now I've already set up Banks forces. They're over there by Cedar Creek, or Cedar Run rather. And um, we'll have Jackson's forces come in here from the south and the west. So I'll do a video uh, after each uh, player has moved and fired, give you the results. Now, um, the Union moves first in this game. Each turn represents about uh, 20 minutes, no, 30 minutes. And then the Confederate moves. Uh, but on turn one, uh, the Union uh, does not move. So we'll uh, do a turn one, turn two, turn three maybe, and I'll see how the video is going, just to give you an idea what this uh, great little system is all about. Okay, here's the situation after the Confederates have moved for turn one. Nothing too complicated. Ewell and Trimble have come on the board here, and Early's Brigade is marching up the road. So that's the end of turn one, since the Union did not move on turn one. On turn two, which is the 3 p.m. turn in the afternoon, the Union will move first. Okay, now we're going to look at the 3 p.m. turn, just the Union move. And what I've done is the Union have done a general advance all across the line, more or less staying in tight formation, cavalry on the flanks, and I've unlimbered the guns and then bringing them up. So Banks' army has crossed Cedar Run, and uh, they don't seem very shy to engage with uh, Stonewall Jackson's men. 
Now Stonewall Jackson's men will be moving next to finish the uh, 3 p.m. turn. All right, this is the situation after the Confederates have moved for the 3 p.m. turn. Early's brigade is still in column, except for the two lead uh, regiments, the 12th Georgia and the 31st Virginia. They've gone to line and they've passed through the one victory point hex. And uh, Jackson's column, or rather Ewell and Winder, have entered the board and uh, are now proceeding. So that's the end of the 3 p.m. turn. No action yet. That's the general situation. Okay, this is the situation after the Union have moved for the 4 p.m. turn. You can see that they're guarding their left flank here at the bridge with the um, main cavalry just dismounted. The artillery is coming up here, limbered, and their main line is now within range of the Confederates' long-range fire. So this regiment here, 12th Georgia, is going to do some defensive fire. Now, granted, it is long-range, but... Uh, Let's see what the um, what will happen with these first defensive fire shots. Okay, that's the result of the first fire of the game. 12th Georgia pinning down the um, 8th and 12th Regiment under Prince. So first blood goes to the Confederates, just pinning that unit down. The Confederates now will be able to move for their 4 p.m. turn. Let's see what they can do. Okay, this is the situation after the 4 p.m. turn, after the Confederates have moved. And uh, we're going to see some firing this turn for sure on the behalf of the Union. You can see that Early's or Brigade has sort of gone into line now on this crest. They were worried about being outflanked over here through the woods. So 31st uh, Virginia went off to the left. The Confederate also limbered some bat unlimbered some batteries over here to cover and Jackson and the boys are still coming up from the rear so I don't know if I've made a good move here for the Confederate but let's do the Union defensive fire and uh, see what happens now the Union had some very interesting defensive fire that turn they were actually able to pin down these three Confederate units but that's going to be irrelevant now because at the end of the Confederate phase these pin markers come off so when you pin a unit is actually quite critical and actually uh, prevent a guy from moving. But uh, that was an interesting defensive fire, long range, but uh, the Union was able to do something. So um, we'll continue on and go to the 430 turn and see what the Union can do. Okay, this turn could be very, very interesting. And I'm not saying that my play is optimal either. I'm just kind of exploring the system and trying to show in a video how the system works. So what Banks has done is more or less done a frontal assault all along the line. Bayard's cavalry over here is able to edge over and just get into the well part of the rear of Early's brigade. The rest are doing a frontal assault and uh, Early is outnumbered but he's on some nice defensive terrain. And we've also got an interesting situation here with a uh, 12-pound Napoleon battery being assaulted with uh, supporting infantry. So the Confederates will do their defensive fire, and then I'll uh, show you on video what's happened. Should be a very interesting uh, phase. Okay, the Confederates did very well on their defensive fire. A couple of bad rolls, but overall pretty good. They pinned down this unit here under uh, uh, OJ, under Green, and and that unit took 50% casualties. That's the 78th New York. And it also got a pin result. Um, this unit was pinned down too, also taking... Uh, no, that wasn't that one. Someone else took casualties here. Oh yeah, this uh, cavalry took some casualties charging in. So, uh, the Confederates didn't do too bad on their defensive fire. Now the Union will do their offensive fire and uh, see about May Lee. So Banks, uh, Banks just may take this position. Hard to say. We'll catch the video after I've done the combats. Okay, this is after Union fire combat, offensive fire. And uh, they didn't do too bad. They pinned one unit here and they caused 100 casualties on this very small 31st Virginia. Now we're going to do the May Lee phase. 
And it doesn't look very good for the 31st Virginia. They're being charged by cavalry across the open field. Uh, and I forgot to mention one unit routed over here. 25th Virginia routed in the fire combat against against it. So Union is uh, driving a bit of early force. Let's see what happens after the melee now. Okay, the Union decided to only melee in one place, and that was with Bayard's cavalry there. They ended up capturing the 31st Virginia, which had only been reduced down to a one. So um, the Union did very well on that melee. So we'll do the final command phase remove the pin markers from the Union and the Confederates will do their move. Now as the series developed they um, added the Brigade Combat Effectiveness Rule and I certainly recommend you play with that and what that means is you have to record the casualties as regiments take their uh, lumps and that affects the effectiveness of the Brigade. So you can see here the Greens Brigade has already taken two casualties and it can only really take three before it becomes uh, brigade combat effectiveness um, and that uh, hurts. It was uh, to prevent abuses that occurred in the early system where players would just fight regiments until they were destroyed and uh, the brigade combat effectiveness rules are very good in this game. It's one of the reasons I like this tactical system. I find it uh, very realistic. Okay, this is the situation after I've just moved the uh, Confederate troops. And the Confederate troops are in a bad way, that's for sure. Because Early's brigade here is really pinned down. This one is literally pinned. Now the 12th Georgia could back up, I suppose. But if they do that, they'll get withdrawal fire from the yard. So... I think they're just going to stay and take their lumps, and maybe this 4th Maryland battery is going to be able to smash Bayard's cavalry up. And the independent Napoleon here, the 1st Maryland, will just stand the ground too. So I think I was a bit impetuous moving early up so fast and deploying. Now the rest of Jackson's columns is coming up fast, but early is going to be very, very uh, bloodied, I think. So I'll do the Union defensive fire and uh, let's see what happens. Okay, this is the situation after the Union defensive fire. They got bad luck here, not doing much against this battery, but they caused casualties on the 12th Georgia, although oh, the 12th Georgia held their ground, and they didn't uh, do too bad, well, no, they actually destroyed another unit over here. So Early's brigade has got four hits on it, now you can take eight before he goes BCE, but early is taking his lumps, that's for sure. Now we'll do the uh, Confederate offensive fire, and let's see if they can push these Union troops back. Okay, the Confederates did fairly well on that turn. They actually routed two units here, 5th Ohio, and they also inflicted casualties on them, and the 111th Pennsylvania. So, um, they held the Union off, and... Uh, they're taking casualties. So I'm going to fill in another turn or so and we'll just see where this goes. Um, I mainly want to show the tactics in the game to show you um, how it's played and um, I don't know. It's my favorite tactical battle system of the uh, Civil War games and uh, I really enjoy this series. Anyway, let's do another turn and see what happens. Okay, this is the situation after the Union have moved, and it's not too pretty for Early's Brigade. Bayard's cavalry has managed to work in and slam into the rear of the 12th Georgia. Geary's Brigade here is going in with the 7th Ohio, 29th, and another regiment slamming into the 12th from the front. So it's just not good. The Pennsylvania Zoavs are hitting the 13th from the front, coming up that hill, but they've been outflanked by the 102nd New York coming in the rear. 3rd Maryland slammed into the back of the independent battery here and they're doing a frontal attack so the Confederates are going to have to roll mighty nice defensive fire to stop this attack so I think we've got a turning point uh, moment here in the battle certainly against Early's uh, brigade let's uh, catch the action after we've rolled for the Confederate defensive fire okay what a turn that was the Confederate got magnificent dice blowing away some units 
inflicting casualties and they caused the route of uh, two regiments here and uh, a battery over here got routed so their defensive fire did very very well um, now it's up to the Union to see if they can blow away these units and may lead them to death so uh, though the Confederates did well in their defensive fire let's see what the Union can do okay this is the situation after the Union fire they did fairly well too they blew away one of Early's regiments so Early is now brigade combat effectiveness because he's reached eight of his sixteen possible points so that brigade is can't really be used for offensive combat anymore so Early's brigade is all used up Union did fairly well they also caused some casualties here on that stack of the battery and now they'll be doing the melees so after we'll catch the action after the melees and then we'll end the video um, interesting opening. Let's see how they do in the melees. Okay, as I suspected what would happen, the batteries were captured. Biard's cavalry here slammed into those batteries from the rear and captured it. And uh, these two regiments that were attacking caused the 58th Virginia to retreat and then they subsequently captured the 1st Maryland. So the Union are off to a great start in this game, capturing two batteries causing brigade combat effectiveness too early. But of course Stonewall Jackson and the main body are still coming up. So we'll just do a summation here and uh, that will be it. Well in summary, Cedar Mountain is a very representative example of the great battles uh, of the American Civil War. Um, it's a great little game. I only showed up to turn six here. But there's lots of uh, game left in this in this battle yet. Like I said, the Union got off to a great start, kind of wiping out Early's brigade, but I was a bit too impetuous there. I should have taken my time and come up in line and engage. So that's what you happen in this game for being too impetuous. Um, one thing I like about the game is it gives realistic casualties too. Many games you keep fighting until counters go off the board. And I'm not saying counters don't get off the board in this game. They do. We've wiped out a few regiments here. But... Um, it does show realistic casualties overall and uh, does show Civil War tactics uh, very well. So in summary, um, maybe we'll do some more videos on this system. I really like Cedar Mountain. I think it's one of the better titles in the whole series. And um, I'll never get a chance to play the big, big, big ones. You need multiplayer. Uh, well, it's just they're just multiplayer games. They're just so big. I can remember playing Ter Terrible of Sword back in 1976 on a Labor Day weekend with about eight guys and I think we played all weekend and we only got to July 2nd. So um, I like these smaller battles. They're really good. And uh, I think later on I'll end up doing maybe Pea Ridge and some of the uh, Wilson's Creek maybe. Anyway, that's it for Great uh, Battles of the American Civil War. My favorite system on American Civil War tactics. Thank you for watching.